it's just wonderful to have this cross-professional representation um, because it's critical for all of us in the work that, um, working in any capacity, who, with children who are sexually abused, um, with adults who are survivors of child sexual abuse, who are with juveniles who are perpetrators of child sexual abuse, with adults who are perpetrators of child sexual abuse, or the families of any of these individuals. It's, it's critical for all of us to have a comprehensive understanding of this issue in order for us to identify um, perpetrators and perpetration and um, identify uh, victimization and survivors and also to effectively intervene to stop and prevent the perpetration and to assist the um, survivors, the child survivors, the adult survivors, and their families to heal and thrive. And for those in this room, some part of those goals and tasks is your job. It certainly was mine. Um, and unfortunately for many of us, um, we received little or minimal training on this issue. And um, even if we received some, it's likely not sufficient because this is a field where the knowledge and the information and the understanding and the resources are rapidly expanding. And so we all need to not only get informed, uh, but stay informed, stay up to date on the um, information. And it's critical for those of us who are trying to do the work of providing and promoting safety and well-being and justice for the children and the families um, that we serve. Before going any further, I wanna acknowledge and thank each of you in this room. The work you do, and particularly the work you do with regard to child sexual abuse, is hard work, it is emotionally draining, it is mentally draining, and sometimes it's thankless. And um, there's a personal cost to doing the work, and everybody in this room knows it. And yet, you're all here because you care deeply about the children and the families that you serve. And there are many other jobs, prettier jobs, easier jobs, but you've chosen this particular service. And for that, you truly deserve and you have um, my deep appreciation and gratitude and respect. So anyway, it's the hope and intent of those who have planned uh, this conference and for future trainings that the information that you receive today will give you tools and insight and confidence and resources to support um, your work and that what we provide to you can come close to matching the courage and the tenacity and the compassion that you bring to this work uh, for children and families in our community. So let's get started. Um, I do only have a very brief uh, time to go over a lot of information with you, so um, I'm gonna go quickly. And um, you have been provided with lots of information to go back to if you have the interest in taking a deeper dive. The um, information that I'm gonna be providing today comes from and is the result of the work of the Task Force on the Prevention of Sexual Abuse of Children. Uh, some of you may or may not know about this task force. Um, sometimes it's referred to as Michigan's Aaron's Law Task Force. Um, it was time limited. There was, it was created by statute. Uh, members were appointed by the governor. There was one year to do the work. And um, the materials that you have the, and the materials on the PowerPoint are very detailed. I'm only going to be using a few of those slides and I'm, I'm going to uh, skip over some of them. But I wanted you to have them so that if you are interested in more in-depth information, um, it is this uh, PowerPoint as well as the actual final report of the task force on the prevention of sexual abuse of children, which was sent to you, I think last night in a link, is that correct? Yesterday. Yesterday. Um, uh, a link of it was sent to you. You can find it online. It's comprehensive in its findings and recommendations, and there's a bibliography with an extensive resource list um, and all the background information that supported the recommendations of the task force. So if you're interested in that, you have that, and I encourage you in the copious free time that you do not have to 
um, take a look at it if you are interested. So anyway, I will be skipping over a number of these uh, slides that deal with um, the details of the work of the task force and, frankly, its recommendations. Um, but the recommendations are specific with regard to uh, various professions, and they're also uh, broad with regard to the issue of how do we stop and prevent uh, child sexual abuse in the state of Michigan. All right. So um, the overarching mandate of the task force was to um, make recommendations uh, about stopping and preventing child sexual abuse in the state, um, and also to make recommendations for school policies that address the sexual abuse of children. So that's all in there. There were also very specific mandates that the task force was required to, to fulfill, in gathering information, consulting with experts, um, creating goals for state policy, creating recommendations and guidelines for school policies, um, and that is all in the information that has been provided to you. But that's where um, the information that I'm going to be giving you today came from, the work of that task force. It was cross-professional, cross-disciplinary, and um, the data that you're getting is the result of the work of that task force, digging into um, sources um, that are available nationally and um, across the state. All right. so. Um, with regard to um, child sexual abuse definitions. For purposes of the task force, we actually had to consider, what do we mean, child sexual abuse? How are we gonna stop, and what are we trying to stop and prevent? And I just wanna briefly talk about um, legal definition versus kind of behavioral definition. You all are aware in the work you do within the child welfare system um, that the child protection law covers specific sorts of um, child sexual abuse. And child sexual abuse, um, the definition in the uh, child protection law, well, the child is defined as someone under the age of 18. and. Um, Sexual abuse is defined in the Child Protection Code as um, engaging in sexual contact or sexual penetration with a child as those terms are defined in the criminal law or sexual explo exploitation um, as that is defined in the Child Protection Code. They, specifically, the Child Protection Law defines sexual exploitation to include allowing, permitting, or encouraging a child to engage in prostitution, or allowing, permitting, encouraging, um, or engaging in the photographing, filming, or depicting of a child engaged in a listed sexual act. Um, that references the, and then it references our criminal code. But for purposes of the child protection law, as you all know, um, these, the behaviors have to have been perpetrated by a parent, a legal guardian, or any person responsible for the child's health or welfare, or by a teacher, teacher's aide, or a member of the clergy. So you specifically will be dealing with that definition in the work that, that you do, but it's important to understand that that is not the universe of child sexual abuse, and I think you know that, um, but it's important to understand that because the children and the families that you're dealing with um, may very well have experienced sexual abuse or sexual exploitation that is not a legal basis for bringing them within the child protection system, um, but nonetheless, they have been exposed to it and other systems may be dealing with it. And one way to get a handle on the scope of those, the kinds of behaviors um, and the perpetrators of those behaviors that children and families in the state of Michigan and nationally experience is to consider um, our criminal law. And the task force uh, considered sexual abuse or sexual exploitation um, to include the exploitation of any child, regardless of the perpetrator's relationship to the, um, 
to that child. And the task force even considered behavior that is um, not necessarily criminalized, but is grooming behavior. May not necessarily be criminalized, but the task force considered, because if, if we were tasked with stopping and preventing, making recommendations to stop and prevent child sexual abuse, you want to stop and prevent the behaviors that are leading to that perpetration. So the task force considered all of that with regard to um, its definition of child sexual abuse. And again, I, I invite you to consider um, the definitions in the criminal law, um, criminal sexual conduct, the contact or the penetration um, that is perpetrated by anybody under a whole range of circumstances, sex trafficking of children, uh, using the internet to commit or attempt to commit a sexual offenses um, when, the in, when the intended vic victim is a minor, um, accosting, enticing, or soliciting a minor for um, immoral purposes, and disseminating sexually explicit material to a minor. Um, kind of gives you a, a, a broader range of the kinds of behaviors that are sexually abusive or sexually exploitive of children um, that our law has criminalized. Um, and you may be dealing with children and families who have experienced that, even though um, they're not within the child welfare system uh, because of that particular um, type of behavior. They're in for the more narrow um, situation that's defined under the child protection law. So the point being um, that the behaviors defined in the child protection law are a subset of the broader range, the broader universe of uh, behaviors and relationships um, that are sexually abusive and that our kids and families experience. Um, moving along to um, some data. Let's see. Again, you have all of this information in your um, materials. Getting a handle on the prevalence of child sexual abuse um, is very challenging. We learned that in the task force. And um, I want to acknowledge Dr. Angie Kennedy. She's a professor, professor of social work at Michigan State University. She uh, was a leader in gathering and helping us understand the data. Um, with regard to uh, child sexual abuse. Now, you're gonna see different sorts of, and you probably have, different sorts of, of data about child sexual abuse that seem to give a whole, a broad range of information and might appear to be contradictory. What we learned is that um, there are annual rates that some studies cover annual rates of child sexual abuse that may be reported into a system. Some studies and some data will deal with lifetime prevalence, surveys that are done that people report over the course of their lifetime um, and during their childhood did they experience certain types of abuse. Um, and then different ages are included in different surveys, different behaviors are included in different research and studies, so that um, really getting a handle on a precise figure, a precise number, a precise um, reflection of the prevalence of child sexual abuse is very challenging. So that's important to understand going into it. And also that given the secrecy and given the stigma associated with child sexual abuse, um, we know it is vastly underreported. And um, so these numbers um, and even the statistics that we do have, uh, it's very concerning that they are um, quite underrepresentative of, of what is actually going on. Um, and we do know that official systems counts for example, what's reported to CPS or what's reported into the criminal justice system, what's reported to law enforcement, are um, vastly under, underestimated because most 
child and adolescent sexual abuse is not disclosed to formal systems. And we know that they don't disclose because of fear of being disbelieved and fear of what will happen to them. Um, the, the task force also um, surveyed uh, public, surveyed survivors, surveyed families um, who had experienced child sexual abuse. And um, what we learned is that uh, some of the experiences um, had led them to be very distrustful of the systems. And I include, you know, all of us in that, you know, judges, prosecutors, whomever. And, it, and so it's incumbent on all of us to um, learn as much as we can about this because if we build trust that we know what we're doing and we actually be helpful to the children and the families who disclose to these systems, they're more likely to disclose. And we know that if they don't disclose, there's nothing much that um, can be done to stop or prevent the perpetration with regard to a particular child or more broadly to other children. What we do know is that children and adolescents are at high risk for child sexual abuse. All right, let's look at what we found with regard to annual rates. National survey data about annual um, rates of child sexual abuse suggest a wide range of victimization. And again, for all the reasons I just talked about. And they range from 4.2 per 1,000 to 32 per 1,000. Now that translates to an annual national number of child and adolescent child sexual abuse rate victims ranging from 320,000 to over 2 million. The, um, this, this PowerPoint presentation references when it says the report, pages three and four, it references the report that you received um, via link last night. And in that report, the report has the specific source for each of these um, sources, the, each of these data sources. So if you're interested in that, you can follow up. Now when those national rates are applied to Michigan's um, population of minor residents, we use the 2012 numbers, the estimate would be between 10,427 to 75,539 children and adolescents experiencing child sexual abuse each year in Michigan. Um, with regard to lifetime rates, assessments of lifetime rates of child sexual abuse that are examined retroactively among adults via surveys, you know, asking them, did this happen to you as a child? Not necessarily reported into a system, but self-report. Um, indicates that 25 to 40, 40 percent of women and 8 to 13 percent of men report at least one form of sexual abuse victimization by the time they were 18. Michigan lifetime rates are difficult to assess based on we just don't have the data to um, do a very good assessment. We do know that um, in 2013 the Michigan Behavioral Risk Factor Surveillance System uh, did a, an annual phone survey of adults in Michigan. Now they had a limited number of screen, screening questions, a uh, limited number of behaviors and ages that were considered. So we know already that's an underestimate, but that uh, report or that data sh uh, indicated that 16% of women and 5% of men reported a history of victimization. All right, who are perpetrators? National data. Contrary to media portrayals and common stereotypes which focus on stranger danger, over 80%, 80% of child sexual abuse cases involve a perpetrator who is known to the victim, such as a family member, acquaintance, or dating partner. Uh, they use that relationship to leverage trust and access and maintain secrecy. Um, they can be prominent, respected, and trusted members of the community because that's what gives them access and trust. More than 90% of 90% are male, and among adult perpetrators, most are young men under the age of 40. And here's a startling statistic to our task force, and maybe it's not startling to you. Between 30 and 40% of offenders are under the age of 18 themselves. Now that has tremendous implications for our policies and our uh, responses to child sexual abuse. 
What about Michigan? What does our Michigan data tell us? Um, the task force uh, contacted uh, the Michigan State Police, who looked at their microdata, which is the Michigan Incident Crime Reporting data. So now this is information that's reported into law enforcement. So again, we know it's a it's not reflective of what's actually going on, but in Michigan, this is what was reported to law enforcement. Um, and then that data was analyzed by um, the Michigan um, it's a phenomenal resource we have in our state. Michigan Statistical Analysis Center, which is a collaboration between Michigan State University and Michigan State Police. It is that full report is uh, tab C, attachment C, in the materials that were emailed to you last night. It's a remarkable assessment. But anyway, that data of what was reported into Michigan's um, law enforcement um, community during the year 2013 um, those statistics really do mirror the national statistics. 91% of the perpetrators were male, 36% were under the age of 18, 35% were between the ages of 18 and 34. And over 80% of the perpetrators were known to the victim. With family members, a parent, a grandparent, a sibling, compri or comprising 39% of the reported perpetrators, only 4% were strangers. 33% um, were acquaintance or otherwise known, 9% uh, were a friend, 8% uh, were a current or former dating partner, and neighbors were 2%. Um, I'm not going to go into motivations for offending, that is Tom's um, bailiwick, but um, just to say that most perpetrators are not pedophiles, and he's going to tell you who they are and why they do what they do. And um, what about female perpetrators? Uh, we learned that not much is known about them. And Tom will be talking about uh, that a bit as well. Um, rehabilitation of sex offenders. Um, Tom's going to do the deeper dive into what can be done and how do we know what can be done. But the major point that I wanted to bring to your attention is that comprehensive and accurate risk assessment is critical to effective interventions. <laughs> so we have to know what is a comprehensive and what is an, an accurate um, risk assessment, which will lead to appropriate identification of interventions. And it's also important to know that um, sex offenders who receive treatment do have a lower recidivism rates compared to sex offenders who are not treated. But there's a caution with regard to the data and the definition of recidivism. Different studies will um, define recidivism differently. So if recidivism is counted as somebody was arrested or somebody was convicted, we know that um, that does not necessarily uh, uh, capture who's perpetrating because the information is not reported into systems by victims. All right, um, juvenile perpetrators. Um, Tom will be talking about who they are, but the point I want to make to you is that they are more responsive to treatment than adults, um, and there are certain types of interventions that have been shown to be quite effective uh, with juvenile uh, perpetrators. Tom Cottrell's work is all over this, and he's going to be talking about it. Uh, very quickly, who are victims of child sexual abuse? The majority, 80 to 90 percent, are girls. The Michigan MICER 2013 data parallels the national data. 80 percent of child sexual abuse victims uh, were girls. And again, this is MICER data, so this is what was reported to law enforcement in Michigan in 2013. And 20 percent were boys. Girls were more likely to be victimized at ages 13, 14, and 15. So heads up, you know, adolescents um, are, girls are at highest, highest risk during that age range. Um, and we have to think about our system's responses and our own attitudes about believing adolescents um, when they do disclose. Um, girls, there's a higher risk also overall in ages 12 to 17 and interestingly at age 4. Uh, boys were most likely to be victimized based on the um, micro data between ages 3 and 9 and at ages uh, 14 and 15. And the most frequent victim offender age differences 
or between zero and 10 years, so relatively close in age. Although, you know, the data also show, I mean, the oldest perpetrator in the 2013 uh, data was 93 years old. So, and again, that was what was reported into um, the, uh, but, but this is primarily young uh, offenders. Um, it is, so discovering disclosure, Joyce Siegel, who is an expert on um, survivors and uh, working with uh, survivors of child sexual abuse, um, will be doing, doing the deeper dive into the survivor and victim issues this afternoon. But again, just briefly, um, I want you to understand it's a myth that survivors, child sexual abuse victims, will always or typically exhibit injuries. Multiple studies demonstrate that when children and adolescents uh, disclose severe, um, oh, excuse me, demonstrate that even when children and adolescents disclose severe sexual abuse, like repeated vaginal and anal penetration, or, ha or are pregnant as a result of sexual abuse, 87 to 94% will have normal genital exam findings. So child or adolescent, adolescent disclosing abuse is the single most important means of discovering it, and without disclosure, the most child sexual abuse will remain secret. And false allegations of child sexual abuse are rare, ranging from two to 4% of investigated cases. Um, reasons for non-disclosure, two-thirds of the victims of child sexual abuse do not tell anyone uh, about the sexual abuse prior to turning age 18. Research has yielded no consistent relationship between the likelihood of disclosure and the severity of the abuse. The two most common reasons for non-disclosure are fear of being blamed and fear of being disbelieved. And um, again, it's uh, response, the response of all of us to disclosure not only affects whether or not that case is going to go forward and whether the perpetrator is going to be identified and whether appropriate interventions can be put in place, but how we respond actually affects the healing and the recovery of the um, child and the family. So again, it is critical for all of us um, and family and friends and school uh, folks to know how to respond to a child's disclosure. Um, I want to wrap up here um, with just uh, a reference to, again, the bibliography that is attached to the report that you received last night, extensive information um, specific to um, your professions and uh, specific to issues of prevention. And then also uh, direct your attention, the last slide on this PowerPoint, what I won't take time to to rush through. There's an additional new resource, the Sex Offender Management and Assessment Planning Initiative from the U.S. Office of Justice Programs has an adult section uh, research briefs and a juvenile section research briefs. Um, and the website is on that last slide. Really great information and it's really digestible and understandable um, for um, dealing with these cases. So with that, um, again, I, I invite you and ask you to please take a look at those recommendations. Uh, we on the task force looked at child sexual abuse prevention and response from a public health model. We looked at um, primary prevention, how do we prevent it before it begins? And secondary prevention, what about resp the initial response to an incident that has occurred? Um, how do we pre how do, do we respond initially so that to prevent um, further um, perpetration and also um, further harm to that victim and then tertiary uh, prevention being the long term response in the long haul how are we going to respond to the perpetrator how are we going to respond to that uh, victim that survivor um, for purposes of preventing um, further harm and further perpetration. So the recommendations are very extensive, and the one last thought I want to leave you with, and I give Tom credit for this language, I think the most important um, recommendation that our task force came up with in terms of what we need to do to prevent child sexual abuse 
is to stop growing perpetrators. And we need to look at uh, what's going on in our communities, our culture, our um, families to um, promote uh, attitudes that support um, growing perpetrators. All right, I'm going to turn it over to Tom now. Thank you.